in the early 80s. In America, the, the major labels dominated what was going on musically much more than, say, in Europe. So the only way to get your music around was to record it yourself, pay for it yourself, copy it yourself, and mail it to people yourself. This is the actual tape that I got from K.J. Doughton in summer 1982. This is the tape that started it all. Like, this was my introduction to Metallica. So, Max out. So yeah, back in the day, obviously there were no internet, no Spotify, no nothing. So the only way you could kind of find out about bands is you had pen pals. Some back of magazines you'd see guys talking about, I'm into this band or that band, let's talk. In July 1982, I sent my pen pal ad in and it was ran here. Wanted, headbangers from anywhere. England, Europe, Japan, Canada, US to trade tapes and or photos. I'm heavily into Sabbath, Scorps, Priest, etc. It wasn't a case of pressing a button and getting the music. It was a case of writing a letter to somebody, going to the post office, waiting for a response. You know, you're waiting for that letter to come in or that tape to come in from Europe, England, or even Japan. Tape trading was pretty much the internet now. You know, you were able to hand the tape around. It'd be like 10th generation copy, but you, you would still hear the magic in whatever was happening there and think, Wow, I've discovered yet another piece of my puzzle. I'm putting together how my life is gonna be, and this is a part of that. Southern California, there was an energy, kind of the surf, beach, and blonde hair dudes. I thought there was a shallowness to all that stuff that made me go on this almost endless journey to find other like-minded people. So in the summer of 1981, I was traveling through Europe in London. I found Motorhead. When you hover long enough, occasionally you get uh, invited inside. I ended up in a room with three band members and just sat there and watched them write and rehearse for their next record, which was kind of a mind fuck. That inspired me to go back to California and reach back out to somebody who I'd met briefly a few months before, uh, James Hetfield. When I met Lars, yeah, he was pretty much a stinky European kid. My friend and I, we were looking for a, a drummer. But we auditioned Lars. He performed poorly. <laughs> we said, thanks, but no thanks. And we said, yeah, we'll call you. And that was that. So when I was putting together this compilation of local LA heavy metal bands, at one point Lars were hanging out or something and he said, hey, if I can put together a band, can I have a track on the record? I'm like, sure. And Lars contacted me saying, hey, remember me? I've got a record label interested in me. That was extremely interesting to me because I was just trying to find people to jam with. I think the primary connection to James early on was that he seemed to be just as disenfranchised as myself. Wow. I had a lot of energy and tenacity. He had a lot of talent. Maybe I was slightly less awkward. He was really awkward. <laughs> Kid had a lot of money. He had huge record collection, awesome stereo. He introduced me to a whole nother world of music. Here in LA, at the scene at the time was Motley Crue and Rat, and it was heavy, but not like European style heavy. The type of stuff that I was into, obviously, you know, Motorhead, Iron Maiden, Diamond Head, Angel Witch, all these bands, it was, it was a little more next level. James connected with some of that music instantly and just seemed to have a little more depth to him. It was troubling times, though I didn't really know it. I was identifying with a lot of this music. It was speaking for me, it was loud, it was fast, it was giving me a voice. Sonically was barking, it was yelling for me through a guitar. So we have the very first Metallica flyer. The very first show was at Radio City, which is in Anaheim. The show was horrible. Couldn't have gotten any worse. It was a Sunday night, and we were the only band playing. 
It's maybe 75, maybe 100 people there. Very first song, Dave Mustaine's at the very end doing the solo. Doesn't break one string, doesn't break two strings, breaks three strings. I've been on stage at about two minutes in my life, and there's a lull. Changes the strings, you know, ting, ting, ting. It's literally like time just freezes. Very early on, we would, you know, make copies of the stuff that we had recorded and we would send it to some of these people that were really interested in hearing different stuff and sharing it with other people. Well, first of all, it was Hit the Lights, which we recorded for Brian Slagle's Metal Massacre compilation. Back in 1981, to be on a record was kind of a big thing, and we distributed it all around the world, so the track on the record wasn't phenomenal, but it was good enough that people kind of got interested. And then we made the No Life to Leather demo in the summer of 1982. Down to the post office I went, and off they went all over the world. You knew it was original because with Lars, you always have to have DDK and turn down bass on amp. And you can see that it's in Lars's writing. And this is what really just made the band explode, to be quite honest with you. I was friends with a guy named Johnny Zazula, who owned the record store in New Jersey called Rock and Roll Heaven. Went in there one day and he's like, well, you gotta hear this, you gotta hear this. And he's got this cassette tape and I see No Life to Leather, Metallica. Puts it on and I was just blown away. When the Metal Masker record came out, we were gonna do a little tour, which ended up just being going to San Francisco. And one of the bands that was supposed to do it fell out, so I asked Metallica. So in LA, they didn't quite fit in, but as soon as that first show in San Francisco happened, you could feel the crowd there really being into it. And all of a sudden they start playing and then the, the reaction from the crowd was nothing like they ever had in LA. No better feeling in the world than if you think you're alone in your misery or woe or questionings uh, that someone else says, oh yeah, I, I, here's what I do for that. Oh, wow. So when we came up to the Bay Area, people were there to absorb that. They were there to connect. Bay Soul, take one. Metallica was getting really good. So Lars had asked me, do you know any good bass players? So I told Lars, I said, well, you know, there's this band from San Francisco called Trauma. They're coming down here again in a few weeks. The bass player's amazing. You should come see them. You know, we was, as soon as we saw him, we couldn't believe what a freak he was, and we had to have him. We, <laughs> he's a brother right there. We got to get this guy in our band. The way he attacked his bass and held it and the whole set of dynamics was just otherworldly. He oozed this confidence, this I don't give a fuckness that I felt but didn't know how to do it. I sort of kept badgering him uh, for months and months and months, um, which I've been known to do. Finally, he it came to a point where he said, I'll join your band on one condition, which is that you move to San Francisco. 